Delirium, chapter 18, page 282. <coughs> Mary, bring out your umbrella. The sun shines down on this fine, fine day, but the ashes raining down forever are going to turn your hair gray. Mary, keep your oars steady. Sail away on the rising flood. Keep your candle at the ready. Red tides can't be told from blood. From Miss Mary, a common child's clapping game dating from the time of the Blitz. From Patty Cake and Beyond, a history of play. The lights from the guard hut get suctioned away all at once like they've been sealed back behind a vault. Trees close in around us, leaves and bushes press on me from all sides, brushing my face and shins and shoulders like thousands of dark hands, and from all around me a strange cacophony starts up of fluttering things and owls and hooting and animals scrabbling in the underbrush. The air smells so thickly of flowers and life it feels textured like a curtain you pu could pull apart. It's pitch black. I can't even see Alex in front of me now. Can just feel his hand in mine pulling. I think I might be even more frightened now that I was making the crossing. And I, now, now, then, I think I might be even more frightened now than when I was making the crossing. And I tug on Alex's hand, willing him to understand me and stop. A little farther comes his voice from the darkness ahead of me. He tugs me on. We go slowly through, and I hear twigs snapping in the rustle of tree branches, and I know that Alex is feeling his way, trying to clear a path for us. It seems that we move forward by inches, but it's amazing how quickly we've lost sight of the border and everything on the other side of it, as though they've never existed at all. Behind me is blackness. It's like being underground. Alex, I start to say. My voice comes out strange and strangled sounding. Stop, he says. Wait. He lets go of my hand, and I let out a little shriek without meaning to. Then his hands are fumbling on my arms, and his mouth bumps against my nose as he kisses me. It's okay, he says, speaking almost at a normal volume now, so I guess we're safe. I'm not going anywhere. I just have to find this damn flashlight, okay? Yeah, okay. The struggle to, I struggle to breathe normally, feeling stupid. I wonder if Alex regrets bringing me. I haven't exactly been Miss Courageous. As though he can read my mind, Alex gives me a second small peck, this time near the corner of my lips. I guess his eyes haven't adjusted to the dark either. You're doing great, he says. Then I hear him rustling in the branches all around us, muttering little curses underneath his breath, a monologue I don't quite follow. A minute later, he lets out a quick, excited yelp, and a second after that, a broad beam of light cuts upward, illuminating the densely packed trees and growth all around us. Found it, Alex says, grinning, showing off the flashlight to me. He directs the light down to a rusty toolbox half buried in the ground. We leave it there for the crossers, he explains. Ready? I nod. I feel much better now that we can see where we're going. The branches above us form a canopy that reminds us of the vaulted ceiling of, of St. Paul's Cathedral, where I used to sit in Sunday school to hear lectures about atoms and probabilities and God's order. The leaves rustle and shake all around us, a constantly shifting pattern of greens and blacks set dancing as countless unseen things hurry and skip from branch to branch. Every so often, Alex's flashlight is reflected for a brief second in a pair of... And we're back. Every so often, Alex's flashlight is reflected for a brief second in a pair of bright, wide, blinking eyes, which watch us solemnly from within the mass of foliage before vanishing once again into the dark. It's incredible. I've never seen anything like it. All this life pushing everywhere, growing, as though at every second it's expanding and thrusting upward, and I can't really explain it, but it makes me feel small and kind of silly, like I'm trespassing on property owned by someone way older and more important than myself. Alex walks more surely now, occasionally sweeping a branch out of the way so I can pass underneath it, or swatting at branches blocking our way, but we're not following any path that I can see. And after 15 minutes, I begin to fear that we're just turning in circles, or going deeper and deeper into the woods without any real destination. I'm about to ask him how he knows where we're going when I notice that every so often he hesitates and sweeps his flashlight over the tree trunks that surround us like tall, ghostly silhouettes. Some of them, I see, are marked with a swath of blue paint. The paint, I say. Alex shoots me a look over his shoulder. Our road map, he says, pressing on, and then adds, You don't want to get lost in here, trust me. And then, abruptly, the trees just peter out. One second, we're in the middle of the forest, pinned in on all sides, and the next, we're stepping out onto a paved road, a ribbon of concrete lit silver by the moonlight like a ribbed tongue. The road is filled with holes and cracked and bubbled in places, so we have to step around enormous piles of concrete rubble. It winds up a long, low hill and then disappears over the hill's crest, where another black fringe of trees begins. Give me your hand, Alex says. He's whispering again, and without knowing why, I'm glad of it. For some reason, I feel as though I've just entered a cemetery. 
On either side of the road are gigantic clearings covered in waist-high grasses that sing and whisper against one another, and some thin young trees which look frail and exposed in the middle of all that openness. There seem to be some beams, too, enormous beams of timber piled on top of one another and twists of things that look metallic, gleaming and glinting in the trees. What is this? I whisper to Alex. But just after I ask the question, a little scream builds in my throat, and I see, and I know. In the middle of one of the fields of whispering grass is a large blue truck, perfectly intact, like someone might have driven it up just to have a picnic. This was a street, Alex says. His voice has turned tense, destroyed during the blitz. There are thousands and thousands of them all across the country, bombed out, totally destroyed. I shiver. No wonder I felt like I was walking through a graveyard. I am, in a way. The Blitz was a year-long campaign that happened long before my birth, when my mom was still a baby. It was supposed to have gotten rid of all the invalids and any resistors who didn't want to leave their homes and move into an improved community. My mother once said that her earliest memories were all clouded by the sound of bombs and the smell of smoke. She said for years that the smell of fire continued to drift over the city, and every time the wind blew, it would bring with it a covering of ash. We go on walking. I feel like I could cry. Being here, seeing this, it's nothing like what I was taught in my history classes. Smelling, smiling pilots giving the thumbs up, people cheering at the borders because we were at last safe, houses incinerated neatly with no mess, just as though they were blipped off a computer screen. In the history books, there were no people, really, who lived in the houses. They were shadows, wraiths, unreal. But as Alex and I walk hand in hand in the, down the bombed out road, I understand that it wasn't like that at all. There was mess and stink and blood and the smell of skin burning. There were people, people standing and eating, talking on the phone, frying eggs or singing in the shower. I'm overwhelmed with sadness for everything that was lost and filled with anger toward the people who took it away. My people, or at least my old people, I don't know who I am anymore or where I belong. That's not totally true. Alex, I know I belong with Alex. A little farther up the hill, we come across a trim white house standing in the middle of a field. Somehow it escaped the blitz unscathed and other than a shutter that has become detached and is now hanging at a crazy angle, tapping lightly in the wind, it could be any house in Portland. It looks so strange standing there in the middle of all that emptiness, surrounded by shrapnel and disintegrated neighbors, of its disintegrated neighbors. It looks tiny all on its own, like a single lamb that has gotten lost in the wrong pasture. Does anyone stay there now? I ask Alec. Alex. Sometimes people squat when it's rainy or freezing. Only the roamers, though. The invalids who always move... The invalids who always move around. Again, he pauses for a fraction of a second before he says invalids, grimacing like the word tastes bad in his mouth. We pretty much stay away from here. People say the bombers might come back and finish off the job, but mostly it's just superstition. People think the house is bad luck. He gives me a tight smile. It's been totally cleaned out, though. Beds, blankets, clothes, everything. I got my dishes there. Earlier, Alex told me he had his own special place in the wilds, but when I pressed him for details, he clammed up and told me I'd have to wait and see. It's still weird to think of people living out here in the middle of all this vastness, needing dishes and blankets and normal things like that. This way. Alex pulls me off the road and draws me toward the woods again. I'm actually happy to be back in the trees. There was a heaviness to that strange open space with its single house and rusting truck and splintered buildings, a gash cut in the surface of the world. This time we follow a fairly worn path. The trees are still splattered with blue paint at intervals, but it doesn't seem as though Alex needs to consult them. We go quickly, single file. The trees have been shoved away here, and much of the underbrush has been cleared, so the walk is much easier. Beneath my feet, the dirt has been tamped down over time by the pressure of dozens of feet. My heart starts thumping heavy, heavily against my ribs. I can tell we're getting close. Alex turns around to face me so abruptly I almost slam into him. He clicks the flashlight off, and in the sudden darkness, strange shapes seem to rise up, take form, and swirl away. Close your eyes, he says, and I can tell he's smiling. Why bother? I can't see anything. I can practically hear him roll his eyes. Come on, Lena. Fine. I close my eyes and he takes my hands in both of his. Then he pulls me forward another 20 feet, murmuring things like, Step up, there's a rock, or a little to the left. The whole time, a fluttery, nervous feeling builds inside of me. We stop, finally, and Alex drops my hands. We're here, he says. I can hear the excitement in his voice. Open up. I do, and for a moment, I can't speak. I open my mouth several times and have to shut it again after all that emerges is a high-pitched squeak. Well, Alex fidgets next to me. What do you think? Finally, I stutter out. It's, it's real. Alex snorts. Of course it's real. I mean, it's amazing. I take a few steps forward. Now that I'm here, I'm not sure 
what exactly I was imagining the wilds would be like, but whatever it was, it wasn't this. A long, broad clearing cuts through the woods, although in places the trees have begun to crowd in again, pushing slender stalks towards the sky, which stretches above us, a vast and glittering canopy, the moon sitting bright and huge and swollen at its center. Wild roses encircle a dented sign, faded neatly to ele illegibility. I can just make out the words Crest Village Mobile Park. The clearing is full of dozens of trailers as well as more creative residences. Tarps stretched between trees with blankets and shower curtains to serve as front doors. Rusting trucks with tents pitched in the back of their cabs. Old vans with fabric stretched over their windows for privacy. The clearing is pitted with holes where campfires have been lit over the course of the day. Now, well past midnight, they are smoldering still, letting up ribbons of smoke and the smell of charred wood. See, Alex grins and spreads his arms. The blitz didn't get everything. You didn't tell me. I start walking forward down the center of the clearing, stepping around a series of logs that have been arranged in a circle like an outdoor living room. You didn't tell me it was like this. He shrugs, trotting next to me like a happy dog. It's the kind of thing you need to see for yourself. He tows a bit of dirt over a dying campfire. Looks like we came too late for the party tonight. As we progress through the clearing, Alex points out every house and tells me a little bit about the people who live there, speaking all the time in a whisper so we won't wake anybody. Some stories I've heard before, others are totally new. I'm not even fully concentrating, but I'm grateful for the sound of his voice, low and steady and familiar and reassuring. Even though the settlement isn't that big, maybe an eighth of a mile long, I feel as though the world has suddenly split open, revealing layers and depths I could have never imagined. No walls. No walls anywhere. Portland, by comparison, seems tiny. A blip. Alex stops in front of a dingy gray trailer. Dingy gray trailer. Its windows are missing and have been replaced by squares of multicolored fabric and pulled taut. And, um, this is me. Alex gestures awkwardly. It's the first time he seemed nervous all night, which makes me nervous. I swallow back the sudden and totally inappropriate urge to laugh hysterically. Wow, it's, uh, it's... It's not much from the outside, Alex jumps in. He looks away, chewing on a corner of his lip. Do you want to, um, come in? I nod, pretty sure that if I tried to speak right now, I would only squeak again. I've been alone with him countless times, but this feels different. Here, there are no eyes waiting to catch us, no voices wanting to shout at us, no hands ready to tear us apart, just miles and miles of space. It's exciting and terrifying at the same time. Anything could happen here, and when he bends down to kiss me, it's as though the weight of the velvety darkness around us, the soft flutters of the trees, the pitter-patter of the unseen animals come beating into my chest, making me feel as though I'm dissolving and expanding into the night. When he pulls away, it takes me a few seconds to catch my breath. Come on, he says. He leans a shoulder against the door of the trailer until it pops open. Inside, it's very dark. I can make out a few rough outlines, and when Alex shuts the door behind us, even those vanish, sucked up into black. There's no electricity out here, Alex says. He's moving around, bumping up against things, cursing every so often under his breath. Do you have candles, I ask? The trailer smells strange, like autumn leaves that have fallen off their branches. It's nice. There are other smells, too. The sharp citrus sting of cleaning fluid and, very faintly, the tang of gasoline. Even better. I hear rustling and a spray of water descends on, from above, on me from above. I let out a small shriek and Alex says, Sorry, sorry, I haven't been here in a while. Watch out. More rustling. And then slowly the ceiling above my head trembles and folds back on itself, and all of a sudden the sky is revealed in its enormity. The moon sits almost directly above us, streaming light into the trailer and crowning everything in silver. I see now that the ceiling is, in fact, one enormous plastic tarp, a bigger version of the kind of thing you use to cover a grill. Alex is standing on a chair. Teachers, please pardon this interruption, but this time we can have the fresh plan.